Hello and welcome back. So this is the fourth mock draft video I've posted, but I've done a few more than that just to get a sense of where the players are being drafted. Um, with this particular mock, we finally had a full draft room and boy did that change things. So stay tuned not only to see how that uh, changes my draft strategy a little bit um, to the more realistic draft room, but also where some of these deeper ADP guys are starting to go now that there's a full room and guys are starting to compete for players. Um, I had to adjust my goaltending strategy for this video particularly, um, and it still keeps in line with the original strategy of pushing goalies back, but stick around to see how the goalie run affected my thought process as well. Okay, so first things first, this is not going to be the most visually appealing video I've ever made, so if you usually like the aesthetic for most of my videos, then stick around for the next one, or you can go back and check out one of the other ones I've done, but this video is chock full of strategy and insights, which at the end of the day is more important for you and your team. And for this mock, I ended up, um, I didn't choose it, but I ended up with the second overall pick, uh, which meant two things. Number one, I don't have to think about who to pick, it's Leon Dreisaitl. Um, I completely understand the argument for Matthews at number two, but when you look at the data, the difference in goals last season was five, not as a massive difference. Um, Dreisaitl has dual position eligibility, which helps me plan for other spots in my draft, and the power play numbers for Dreisaitl are better, 0.51 power play points per game, third in the league, and second in the league in power play goals. So all of that makes for a more complete option at number two, though I completely understand if you want to go Matthews uh, at number two in your draft, especially if your league is weighting goals a little bit more heavily. This was a standard category league for Yahoo, which included plus minus instead of blocks. Um, so I decided to go with dry idle at number two, mainly for the positional flexibility and what I just mentioned there. So strategy-wise, uh, picking second, I check where I'm going to be drafting next. And at that point, will be the back end of the snake, and I'll have two picks very close together at 23 and 26. So I highly advise if you um, are at that first position in your draft, take a look at where you're drafting second and third. If you have picks close together, that helps you uh, figure out your strategy a little bit better um, it, as opposed to just going into it round by round blind without thinking forward, thinking ahead of where you're going to try to find guys uh, at value in the next couple of picks. So I know that at 23 and 26, I need to come away from those two picks with one elite level defenseman. And here I decided to go for that uh, with the first of the two picks, just given the fact that there were several winger options for the other pick that were still available. So you can see here, I ended up going with Pasternak, Miller was available, uh, Goudreau, Landis Gog, Kyle Connor, Chris Kreider, um, even Evander Kane. Uh, these guys were all available. So there was a ton of winger goal scorers uh, options available. Um, now, with the defensive pick, I went with Ekblad. I was choosing between Ekblad and John Carlson. As you can see, he was the next D off the board. Um, they're very similar files, and somebody asked me about that in the Patreon group uh, the other day. You know, which one of those two guys would I choose? So let's look at that file uh, a little bit more in depth. So here's the comparison between Carlson and Ekblad, and as you can see here, the files are almost identical, and when you see these two players sitting there behind the top four guys who are now off the board, so that'd be Makar, Hedman, Yossi, and Fox, it can kind of be difficult to choose between the two, and uh, so let's take a look just side by side. Um, these Both of these guys are going to be mid-teens in goals. The goal per game numbers are very similar, uh, 0 0.21, 0 0.24. Uh, Ekblad missed some time last year, so his raw number is slightly lower despite the higher per game numbers. Um, excuse me, the assist numbers are identical. So 0.69 assists per game, 0.68 assists per game. Um, obviously the raw numbers lower for Ekblad due to the injury time that he missed. Um, and then, you know, the same thing with the power play points and, uh, the hits totals as well. They're very similar 0.32 power play points per game. Um, now Carlson does have, a, a four more power play goals, but this format, this league format, standard category league does not favor power play goals. Um, so the differentiating factors here were shots on goal where Ekblad had a decided advantage and then the plus minus numbers as well. And now, you know, what I said about thinking ahead in your draft. So uh, there are certain guys that I targeted later in the draft, and we'll see that as we move through this. And I knew I kind of wanted to open myself up to be able to allow for one or two guys that had a low plus minus rating. So a negative, you know, 10, negative 20, whatever it was. And Ekblad shines at a plus 38. 
Uh, he's obviously on one of the best offensive teams in the league, and that was the ter- one of the two determining factors between these two defensemen. Knowing that I'm going to potentially take uh, a minus player later in the draft because he's got a higher value for goal production or shot production or whatever else I'm looking for, and then trying to counteract that proactively by taking Ekblad, who's a plus 38. Um, so that's the thought process behind why I picked Ekblad uh, over John Carlson. Obviously, I wanted exposure to that offense ranked number one in the league with over 4.1 goals per game last year. Um, and I think of John Carlson more as a rock solid option with a long track record of excellence and still getting that PP1 exposure in Washington. So he's still a very good file to own. But with Ekblad being 26, Carlson's 32 years old, Ekblad is more in his prime and is slightly more likely to outperform his previous season and or his career averages because of that, as opposed to Carlson, who's likely had his best seasons in the rearview mirror. So to summarize this, it's a tough call. You'd be happy to have either guy. I went with Ekblad for the shots and the plus minus and the exposure to the top offense in the league and the age difference. So that was the the thinking behind that. But either way, I'm happy. I ended up um, with Dreisaitl, Ekblad, and then the next decision that I had to make was between Pasternak and guys like JT Miller, Johnny Goudreau, Gabe Landeskog, Kyle Connor, etc. Um, now, I just went over all of these guys' files recently in both the right-wing and left-wing goal targets videos um, and some of those player shorts that I've been doing. But the conclusion I came to was that Pasternak is basically a first-round pick every year for a reason. His goal ceiling is higher than anyone else left on the board, .68 goals per game back in 1920, which was over a 50-goal pace. Um, While Kyle Connor just came off a career season in which he put up 45 goals and a 1.17 point per game, Um, and I've also mentioned how Kreider hit 52 goals last year, uh, but everyone is kind of expecting a regression from that number. Um, and in terms of the point per game numbers, Pasternak's ceiling is a little bit higher than Kyle Connor's as well. For both Kreider and Connor, I assumed it would be slightly more difficult for them to repeat a career season with another career season than for Pasternak, to, Pasternak excuse me, to outperform what he did last year. And last year, he slightly underperformed his 1.12 point per game five-year average despite hitting his five-year goal per game average of 0.53. So he was still a really good goal scorer last year underperformed points wise um, that may be you know a couple different factors Krejci was gone he was playing with Hala that line was still very effective though Um, they were 13th in the league in terms of goals for so they were still very effective but he will be either playing with Bergeron or Krejci this year Uh, and he did have some chemistry with Taylor Hall so that could be another thing to factor in but in addition to that goal ceiling I wanted to add the shot volume to my team as well so 4.33 shots per game last year fourth in the league um, I also have Dreisaitl, who was 18th in the league in shots, and Ekblad just under three shots per game. So I now have excellent shot coverage with my top three picks. So the main determining factor, other than those two, was the positional scarcity. So recently I looked at the top 50 uh, players ranked by goal per game average. Uh, mainly did that for the goal analysis. And of those top 50 players, there were only seven pure right wingers. There were seven dual position left wing right wingers. Uh, So goal scoring right wingers are more valuable than left wingers, which led me to Pasternak over Kreider or Connor. Now I could have gone dual position JT Miller, who had an excellent file. Uh, I will hopefully be posting one of his short videos uh, in the next day or two. And then Gabe Landeskog, who I posted yesterday, um, and he had a, a very interesting file as well. I went into that in detail in the left winger video. But I personally think that Pasternak's proven track record is more reliable than those two players, and the right wing eligibility was more valuable to me and my team, especially if I'm going to use Dreisaitl as a center left wing. Um, So yeah, that was the thought process behind Pasternak. I would have been happy with any of those other guys, to be honest with you. Um, But just looking at the ceiling there for Pasternak, a lot of Bruins fans have been messaging me telling me that he's not going to, you know, dip a little bit as you know some of the the earlier videos I was thinking he he needs that perfection line to put up those career numbers and I still kind of stand by that but I don't think his production is going to dip that much he is a guy who drives production on his own so that will um, likely be a value pick in the third round now after this pick after this Pasternak pick I have to wait 21 picks so I'm planning ahead now and I'm I'm know that I'm going to pick at 47 and 50 so I have a decision to make 
Uh, I know that with one of these two picks, I have to pick up an, uh, another elite defenseman, according to uh, my strategy, where you need two elite defensemen in the, in the first five or six rounds. Um, and if you look at the board in between picks, guys like Latang, guys like Cider, they end up going uh, right here, Latang, right here, Cider. Um, and so it's starting to trickle out. They haven't jumped at these D, so there's still some good available options. Uh, but I know that I need to target one of those guys uh, with my next pick. So the main debate here was whether or not to go with a goalie in this range as the elite G1s are starting to dry up. You can see Shesterkin, Vasilevsky, Saros, Markstrom, they're off the board. Uh, Anderson, Ottinger, Sorokin, uh, they're off the board. Um, Demko and Fleury. So, you know, these guys are starting to go in this range. This is not necessarily a goalie run, but all the elite guys are starting to get taken up here. Um, so I do have to decide at this point in the draft, do I want to target one of those goalies? But guys weren't really jumping to grab them. As I just said, there wasn't really a goalie run. It's like every other pick, every couple of picks, there's a goalie thrown in there. But I figured I'd push them back to the sixth round because guys weren't jumping to grab them. And there were still a number of options uh, that were still available on the board. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but what I wanted to do here uh, before this, so I knew I needed an elite defenseman and I knew um, I was either going to go goalie or a goal scoring uh, positional player, or typically a winger. So I went with Philip Forsberg there uh, and I, you know, the options that I was looking at to bring it Robertson Forsberg, those guys were all in my queue. Um, so I was targeting one of those guys. They're all left wingers. Debrinkit used to be dual position. He's not anymore. Uh, as far as I've seen thus far, Robertson is a strict left winger and so is Forsberg. So the positional flexibility wasn't there, um, but I was targeting all of these guys. I, I had a Vander Kane on the board there as well. Um, he got taken a little bit earlier. Um, but, you know, seeing those guys go, I knew I wanted to make sure I got that goal coverage. And Forsberg sco scored at a 50 goal pace last year and added 3.27 shots per game. So that does help my shot coverage again. And then on top of that, he does get 1.6 hits per game. So that does help that co category as well. Um, I don't really have much hits coverage thus far. So that was important to uh, to try to factor that in as opposed to taking a guy like Tarasenko or Nylander who don't hit as much. So then I follow that pickup with Morgan Riley. And I viewed him as the safer play with the better power play exposure. Last year, Toronto's power play was number one in the league. Riley's obviously quarterbacking that unit. And their offense was second in the league. Uh, overall, So he will continue to rack up points five on five, especially playing with guys like Matthews, Marner, Nylander, Tavares, etc. But there was a decision to make. So if you notice here on the board, there's Quinn Hughes, Shea Theodore, and Dougie Hamilton. Uh, so let's take a look at why I picked Morgan Riley over those guys. So Riley doesn't score a ton of goals per game, but 10 goals on the year is reasonable. Uh, his career high in a season, however, was 20 goals back in 17-18. That was quite a while ago, but... Um, all the factors are favoring him being able to fall somewhere between that 10 and 20 goal range this year. As I mentioned, the power play uh, exposure to the top unit, um, the number two overall offense in the league, and nothing really has changed other than losing Mikheyev up front. Uh, he doesn't really affect their power play numbers as much. But as you look at the chart at the bottom, Riley didn't lead in any category other than plus minus. So, you know, why did I choose him over these other D in this range? So if you look at every category, He's second in every one of them. So he's not the highest in goals, but he's second. He's not the highest in assists or assists per game, but he's second. Second in points, second in shots behind Hamilton, second in power play uh, behind Quinn Hughes, and he does throw some hits, but he's second in that as well. So what I went for was the more safe option, the more reliable option. Um, you know, only two assists behind Quinn Hughes, that's pretty good considering how prolific Quinn Hughes is at assists specifically. Quinn Hughes doesn't get this, the category coverage. So he would have been a nice option, better power play numbers, better point production, better assist production, not much lower goal totals. Eight goals is not terrible, um, but the shot numbers are pretty low and the hits numbers are non-existent. So that did make him a little bit less valuable in my eyes because this league does count. Uh, hits uh, as well as plus minus his plus minus was fine um, the shot numbers I did have some good category coverage there already but boosting that shot number um, by 0 0.72 shots per game was a little bit of uh, an easy call there and then on top of that you're getting uh, 0.87 hits per game more than Hughes as well um, so now Theodore 
he does have good goal totals, 14 goals. Uh, the assist numbers aren't great. The point totals aren't great. And the power play exposure is not great. So he split time with Petrangelo on that unit, and that definitely affected his production. And that's why he's not a target for me. Normally he would be because of those goal numbers. The shot numbers are strong as well. Um, but the hits coverage is not that great. And the power play, you want that D2 that you get to make sure you're quarterbacking a power play with that guy. Uh, and and this is a timeshare power play unit, apparently. Um, we'll see. Maybe Bruce Cassidy changes things up and one of those two guys runs away with the power play. But um, we'd have to wait for preseason. And this was done before that. So um, the only thing you're getting with Theodore is gold production, uh, which could be targetable for your G3, depending on your strategy. I'm sorry, your D3. Um, with Dougie Hamilton, he's a shot volume monster. So that's the reason you'd pick him. He does get some hits coverage. And this file is a little bit skewed. He obviously missed time last year. Um, he missed 20 games due to an injury. And he didn't crack the PP1 when he came back, which is why his power play numbers are so low. Um, if you look at his goal ceiling, his career high or his five-year high, I should say, was 0.29 goals per game. That's a 23-goal pace, which last year would have ranked second in the league. So that's what Roman Yossi put up last year, just for reference. Um, and his shot volume, I said, is, is, is elite level as well. Um, his power play usage will be much better this year. And in the past, specifically in Carolina, his production was much better at a 0.32 power play points per game average and a 0.25. And I would expect to see something more like that this year. Um, and then you're also getting exposure to Jack Hughes, who I think is also going to have a much better year on the power play as well. But just to conclude, you know, Riley wasn't the best at anything other than plus minus, And that number is a result of his team exposure, which was the main factor in choosing him over these players. Um, but the goals are ownable. Second best of these, these four guys, the assists, as I mentioned, second best, second best. He's very strong in all of these categories, covers a lot of them and you're getting elite team exposure. So, uh, that was the thought process behind Morgan Riley, um, but this just kind of highlights what each guy's good at and what you could target them for. I've seen Hamilton go a lot later in drafts, so he could be a potential um, you know, deeper play, higher reward type of option because uh, these numbers are not indicative of the type of player he is, except for the shot numbers, he is that kind of player, uh, and he does throw some hits as well. His minus 19, I would expect that to bounce up a little bit, um, at least closer to even. But as we head back to the mock, at this point in the draft, in the sixth round, I still have no goalies. And I'm looking at the available talent and wondering if there will be anybody deeper. And it's starting to look like there won't be. Um, the available options you can see here, Swayman, Bobrovsky, Campbell, Knight, Quick, Georgiev, all of them except for Campbell will be in a timeshare. And I did factor that into my decision. And when we look at the 10 to 12 round range, the goalies in that range are Talbot, Bennington, Samsonov, Hart, Thompson, Forsberg, Huso, Allmark, and Fransos. So a bunch of timeshares, and again, the only starters there are Bennington and Hart, both of whom had pretty um, pretty bad numbers last year. Um, you could maybe think of Thompson as a G1 or a, a potential starter, but there's a lot of risk to that file. Regardless, none of these guys were on my G1 board from the goalie targets video except Bennington, who was added mainly for his St. Louis exposure and the fact that St. Louis can't possibly be as bad as last year. But as you look at uh, the goaltending, these are the, the screen grabs from that video. This uh, on the left was the, the elite guys to target, the guys who hit uh, all of the following. So 50 plus starts, above a 915 save percentage, on a team with more than 40 wins, and a team with a top 16 defense in the league. Now, the only reason that Darcy Kemper didn't qualify for that list on the left was because at the time that I made that video, he was unsigned and still technically on the Avalanche, who were below league average in shots against last year. So now he comes to Washington, he signs a five-year deal there. Washington was sixth in the league in shots against last year, so he would definitely qualify for that list on the left over here. Uh, and would be one of those elite guys because he did have a 921 save percentage. He had 30, 37 wins last year. Uh, Washington uh, total had 44 wins, and they might have had more if they could have gotten league average uh, goaltending, which they did not. Um, and Kemper will likely start more than 50 games this year, maybe even hit 60 depending on the performance of Charlie Lindgren. Um, but you notice the list on the right. All these guys crossed out. They were all gone by the time I'm trying to make this decision. 
So all these elite guys are off the board. Some of these guys are off the board. Even some of the uh, the higher risk younger guys, Ottinger, Demko, they're off the board. Flurry's off the board. Hellebuck was gone. So the only guys left, Campbell, Bobrovsky, and Bennington. And then, uh, you know, with that thought process, you know, you could have gone Bobrovsky, but when you go Bobrovsky, uh, he just doesn't get the start volume that I'd like. If I were to go that way, I'd handcuff him with Spencer Knight. But that gets tricky because as soon as you take one of the Florida goalies, everybody else in the league remembers that, oh, yeah, the Florida goalies are there and they target the other one. So you do have to kind of monitor how everyone else thinks in the draft. And that typically has been going on in the mock drafts. Somebody takes one of them and then somebody realizes that and jumps on the other one. So you can't really pair them together often. Um, so I decided to go this way instead. And I like what these guys put up last year, 919, 921 about the same games played, right around the same goals against average, right around the same shutout level, and above 30 wins for each of them. Um, so I do like these guys. They're two G1s, and I got them for my G1 and G2. Um, so, you know, just to summarize the back-to-back -back strategy, I monitored the draft, and I saw earlier on that there was value left in the fourth and fifth round that I could push the goalies back to this range, to the 6-7 range. Um, but by the time I hit that sixth round, the really good G1 options were drying up, and I wanted to make sure that I prioritized goaltending because of that. And knowing that there were great value options for centers and other positions in the eighth to twelfth round range, um, and we'll see that now as we head back to the list. Um, so as I've mentioned in a previous mock video, uh, and by now you've seen me draft this guy three times, is Cole Caulfield. He was my next pick. Um, he has a 40 to 50 goal potential in my eyes, and he was scoring at a 0 .7, uh, 0 .675 goal per game rate. That's a 55 goal pace over an 82 game season, and that was all after the coaching change to Marty St. Louis last year. So I'm banking on at least 40 goals from Caulfield this year, and to get that in the eighth round, uh, and he is dual position eligible, left wing, right wing, that does help my positional flexibility as well. The only concern with him is that plus minus, but as I mentioned before, uh, I thought about that ahead of time with Ekblad at plus 38. So that was one of the guys I was targeting later in the draft, guys like Caulfield, some of these guys on lesser teams that are more likely to be a minus option. If you can get that high plus minus guy early, then you can kind of make sure that you open yourself up to these talented players on bad teams that are going to have a, uh, a worse plus minus. So I thought about that ahead of time, and this was the payoff. I get a... a high uh, reward potential in terms of Caulfield and his goal production, um, and that I don't have to worry about his plus minus as much. So then right after that, uh, the next guy that I take is a player who I still don't understand why he's this low in the draft, and that's Braden Point. I've covered him a few times, um, but very high ceiling, exposure to an elite power play, 34 goal pace over the last five years, 0.93 point per game average with a 1.16 point per game ceiling. He gets 2.6 shots per game. He's 0.33 on the power play points per game metric and 10 power play goals to boot. And then on top of that, he does hit a little bit as well, 1.13 hits per game. And I still think he hasn't hit his ceiling. So, you know, you see that team, they didn't have Kucherov for half the season last year. They didn't have Kucherov at all the year before that. And when they did have that that group together and they were functioning at their best in 18-19, he put up a career season. He was well over a point per game. He was a 40-goal guy. Um, and I think we could see something like that if they are able to stay healthy again. Um, so a very low-risk option here. Usually he's a second or third round pick. I got him in the ninth round, which I consider to be excellent value. And I don't mind the single position eligibility because I have some flexibility already baked in with Dreisaitl, Caulfield, and some of the guys that we'll see in the next slide. So as we move to that next slide, for these rounds, you know, I'm looking at my team and I see Dreisaitl, Ekblad, Pasternak, Forsberg, Riley. Then I come back with the Jari Kemper and then Caulfield and Point. So now I have my D1, my D2, my G1, my G2. Two left wings, one of them is dual position. Two right wings, one of them is dual position. So I feel pretty good about where I'm at right now. But now I need to prioritize that D3. And I know from experience that there's a ton of value centers options later. So I put them on hold for the time being, and I look to round out my D3 and G3 with the 10th and 11 picks. So with that D3, I end up going Thomas Shabbat. More of a gut call than a data-driven one, though his file isn't bad. 
6.11 goals per game last year, seven goals on the season. He's had a high of 14 goals in his rookie season, so that's uh, his ceiling thus far. 0.52 assists per game, 0.58 is his career high in that metric. 0.64 points per game is a little bit low. Usually he's right around that range, so that would be, in my opinion, his floor at this point. 2.93 shots per game. That's going to continue to add to my shot coverage from earlier. The power play numbers, you know, they're not great. 0.22 power play points per game, 13 power play points on the season. But I would expect that to climb significantly this year with the additions they've made in the offseason. And he does get 1.23 hits per game and 1.57 blocks per game. And he was only a minus three last year. So whatever categories your league has, whether there's hits, blocks, or plus minus, he's still ownable and maybe even targetable for hits and blocks leagues. Now for the goaltending, you know, I'll come back to this in a second, but I went with Carter Hart and last year could not have been any worse for Philadelphia. They were fourth worst in shots against, but despite that Hart put up a 905 save percentage, which was right around league average. Now, his goals saved above expected was negative 6.6, which is not good, but it was higher than guys taken ahead of him or around him, like Alex Georgiev, Jordan Bennington, Ilya Samsonov, Marc-Andre Fleury, who was a negative 17.6, by the way. Uh, That was a lot of Chicago uh, bias as well, but it's kind of an eye-popping stat to see for Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, And Carter Hart obviously did not have a good year overall last year or the year before that. Um, but I'm banking on his talent level. Uh, There's not many positives in his file. It was more of a gut play, banking on his elite talent and what he did in his first two seasons. Um, But the other thing that I wanted to mention is the Tortorella bump. So, you know, I think of Tortorella Tortorella as a good defensive coach. Um, And if you look at Tortorella and his time in Columbus, uh, if you take every goal against uh, number at the end of the season and average it out over the seven years there, he was at 226. Uh, And so for 226, that would have ranked sixth in the league last year. So they're not going to be as bad defensively as they were last year. Uh, They might get that Tortorella bump. Now, I made this pick before uh, today's news that Ryan Ellis is probably not coming back this season and may be done for his career. So, um, you know, I was hoping that Ellis would be in the lineup and that would bolster their D a little bit. Um, And I was banking on his elite talent level. In hindsight, uh, I might have gone a different direction. But if you look here, he did start hot last year. So a 915 save percentage, 5-2-2 in October. A 924 save percentage in November with an 8 3 and 3 record, and a 9 11 save percentage in December. So, if he was able to do this again, you could potentially start him for the first couple months and look to trade him when he's, you know, peaking in his value uh, if you don't end up believing in Philadelphia over the long haul. But, uh, and that would have been the play last year. If you had him and by mid November you wanted to get rid of him, uh, his numbers were pretty good. It was looking like a decent file. Um, maybe not the team, but him personally, uh, that would have been the play. But in hindsight, I probably would have either gone with Grubauer, Gibson, or Merz Leakins with this G3 pick. Um, but this is why we do mock drafts, to see where guys fall, to try things out, and to learn a little bit more along the way. Uh, and it's worth mentioning that you know, with my G1 options in Jari and Kemper, I could have just not picked a G3 and instead played the schedule every week. Um, I don't want to have to choose a guy like Hart over one of the other two guys on a heavier Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday schedule. And instead, I could just monitor the schedule week by week and pick somebody who's playing on the off nights, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday uh, nights. So, you know, there's a couple different ways you could go with this. Um, Just for fun, I went with Carter Hart. I probably would not do that in my real draft, and I'm not going to recommend that you do that either. Just wanted to highlight his file um, just in case you were one of those people that was looking to target him in a deeper draft, a deep, uh, deeper league format. Now, as we look at this list, you can see that the goalie run here kind of went off. Uh, a lot of these guys, Bennington, Talbot, Huso, Forsberg, Thompson, Hart, Samsonov, Allmark, Francois, and then, you know, it fades out a little bit. Then you get some of the other guys. Merzlikens went really deep. So that's the 14th round Merzlikens went. Matt Murray went the same uh and that's a little weird to me. So Matt Murray was in the 14th round and Sam Sonoff got picked first. I would assume Matt Murray is going to be the 1A. Um, that's just sort of a gut call, just knowing that he's a Sioux Greyhound and, you know, he does have the better numbers from last season. 
So somebody thought Samsonov would be a better option. Um, Murray goes a little bit later. There are some good options here. Robin Leonard on the IR. I don't think I would, you know, take a shot at him and stash him on the IR. That doesn't seem like a smart play. Um, but this was the goalie run. Um, it was definitely a D2, D3 goalie run, but still nonetheless, uh, that did happen. And I ended up getting one one guy that I would like to have back there. But I did have Brock Besser. He was in my queue, and that kind of factored into it as well. So I mentioned him in a previous video, the right winger video. Uh, so check that out if you want the reasoning behind me targeting Brock Besser. But he was in my queue, and I was hoping to get him, and I didn't. So I kind of had to scramble a little bit and change my strategy on the fly. And I didn't make the best decision with that with the Carter Hart pick. But I did make a nice decision here with my next pick in Vinny Trocek. And I haven't talked about him yet. So let's quickly go into his file. Now, Trocek is at ADP 157 in the 13th round. Um, and I reached a little bit and got him in the 12th. Um, but why would you do that? Why would you target him? Now, first, the goal production fluctuates. But two out of the last five seasons, he's been around 0.37 goals per game. And that was 2021 and 1718. And in those two years, he put up that level of goal production as well as a 0.91 point per game in each of those two seasons. So he had 43 points in 47 games in 2021 and then 75 points in 82 games in 1718. So in those two years, his power play production was very good as well with a 0.38 power play point per game average in 2021 for 18 power play points and a 0.32 in 1718 for 27 points, of which 13 were power play goals. Now, the important thing about that 17-18 season where he established his career highs was that he was being coached by Gerard Gallant in Florida. And as you continue to look at this grainy image of Trocek in Rangers gear, I want to remind you that normally I wouldn't have chosen this quality of an image for this, but it is important to remember that he's now reunited with Gallant in New York, and Gallant has already come out and said that Trocek will be the guy on PP1, and as of now, he will be playing with Panarin and Kraftsoff on the second line. Uh, at least that's the training camp uh, combination thus far. So that will be the reason for highlighting this goal and point potential. Um, as opposed to his average. So he did all of that without Panarin and without an equivalent level talent on his line. And his addition to the fourth ranked power play last year and first in terms of the unit as a whole will definitely boost his power play production back to those career levels that you saw in those two seasons. But the real hidden gem in this file is the hits number at 2.28 hits per game. That is very high for an offensive point producer. And even if he doesn't come out of the gate at a blistering offensive pace, those hit totals will be there, and they are definitely targetable. So I, in this draft, I didn't end up with Tanner Janot. I didn't end up with Tom Wilson. They went in the 11th and 12th round, respectively, to the same guy. Uh, so he was targeting hits as well. But I did get uh, Vinny Trocek, who gives me elite upside in terms of who he's playing with and the unit that he's going to be on on the power play. And then I still get 2.28 hits per game. His plus minus was very good as well last year, plus 21. Um, that was in Carolina, but I don't necessarily expect a massive dip from that going to New York. So that's the thought process behind the Vinny Trocek file. Um, so now I've added some high upside again at center. So I had, uh, you know, Braden Point earlier in this draft. I now add Vinny Trocek in this draft. I then go out and grab my hits guy in Radko Gudis, 4.6 hits per game. So starting to chip away at the hits category with Trocek and Gudis back to back. Um, and then with the remaining picks, I knew I was in need of another right winger. I had Pasternak and Caulfield, who was dual eligible. I had Dreisaitl and Forsberg on the left side, but now I need some more wingers. Uh, so I go with Duclair, who put up 31 goals last year, but... I didn't know at the time of the draft that he was going to be out for half the season with an Achilles injury. Now, that's that's my mistake. I'm, I'm able to keep up on a lot of things in this league, but not everything. And uh, that injury specifically makes him completely unownable to me uh, this year. That Achilles injury kills players. Uh, I just did some research for my fantasy football draft, and uh, one of the players had an Achilles injury. He was a running back, and I, you know, I looked at the numbers for the running backs with the Achilles injury. It just destroys their production, and it's likely to do that at least for this season for Duclair. So I did not, um, you know, in retrospect, I would not have taken Duclair in that position uh, had I known that at the time. I probably would have gone with uh, Adrian Kempe, 
who ex- who's a dual position eligible winger. He had 35 goals last year. He averaged 3.16 shots per game and 1.4 hits per game and decent power play numbers at 16 power play points last year. He's likely going to be playing on the top line with Kopitar and maybe Fiala as well. Um, so that would have been my play had I known about the injury uh, at the time of the draft. So um, just a little bit of, uh, you know, this is why we do the mocks. We have to learn things. We have to make mistakes in order to to improve. And worth mentioning, I had Troy Terry in my queue ready to go. I had been sitting on him for a little while. I could have grabbed him here and maybe got Gudis a little bit later. I chose to do it this way just because I was thinking about hits with Trocek. So Terry would have been my pick. And uh, that 37 goal file, he's very skilled. I could definitely see him uh, putting those numbers up again, either playing with Zegris or Ryan Strom. Um, but he got taken two picks before, so I didn't end up getting him. And then I didn't end up getting Lucas Raymond either right there. He was in my queue as well. But I did get Alexei Lafreniere. So I've mentioned him before. He should see more time in the top six. He's on a great team this year. I hope he finds some power play time because he hasn't had any in his first two seasons. And that has definitely affected his production because at five on five, he is a very productive player. Um, and I, you know, you saw what he did in the playoffs last year. So I kind of wanted access to that upside and it's very low risk. So these guys, these last three picks are very low risk. If any of them don't work out, they're going right to the waiver wire and I'm playing the schedule and, you know, trying to see who, who takes off at the beginning of the season. And then with Taylor Hall, my last pick, um, the high ceiling is obvious former heart trophy winner. His five, uh, uh, his five year best was a 1.22 point per game average in 1718 he followed that up with a 1.12 point per game and his five-year point per game average is relatively high at a 0.90 which he underperformed last year so there could be uh, some potential for a bump especially if he's playing on the same line as Pasternak now stacking pasta and hall could pay off nicely for me if they perform like they did last year Um, last year they had Halla at center and they ranked 13th in the league in goals for by a line uh, and now they'll have David Krejci back as well. Now, quick note on Krejci. He went undrafted in this mock. He's ADP 156, Yahoo rank 807. So he won't show up in many people's draft boards during the draft. And if you think he can return to his former uh, form, or if you want exposure to that top six specifically, uh, that could be a deep value play in deeper leagues. Um, and then some other notables that weren't drafted, Matt Barzell, ADP 158, Nick Suzuki, 159, Grubauer, 160, Manjapani 160.4, Bertuzzi, 164, Logan Couture, very productive player. He's just going to have that minus. That's the only problem. But he is going to get all the, the key looks in San Jose. He's one of the three. There's only three guys on that team that can produce, him, Hurdle, and Timo Meyer. Uh, and he did not get drafted at 168 ADP. Orloff is a good hits guy and blocks guy. He was undrafted at 170. Faravari is excellent for hits. He was undrafted at 173. And then goalies, John Gibson, he was there at 178. Arvidsson for shots, 227 shots last year, ADP 183. He was still on the board. Um, So, yeah, there's a lot of plays there. If you're in deeper leagues, those are some guys you could target. Um, They fell through a 12-team draft that we just did here with this exercise. Um, but yeah, there are some value plays to be had uh, in those ADP ranges. So now to summarize this mock draft, you can see my roster to the right, excluding those last three picks, which are all pretty much droppable if they don't start hot. Um, and they could allow me to play the schedule with some of those empty roster spots if they don't work out. But you can see how Yahoo ranked us after the draft. And I usually don't pay too much attention to this, but I just wanted to highlight what the numbers were in each category in terms of last season's statistics. So these are not projections. These are last year's numbers. And according to those numbers, I would have ranked first in this draft. Now, again, I don't really put too much emphasis into this at all. But just to give you a sense of the goal production, the assist production um, across the board. So, you know, if you average these out per player, On my team, I should get about 24 goals, which is pretty good, 33 assists, plus 11, 18 power play points, 193 shots, and then for the goalies, an average of 28 wins, and uh, Carter Hart brought that down significantly, uh, 2.67 goals against, and a 916 save percentage, as well as 3.33 shutouts per goalie. So 
the the totals were brought down a little bit by certain guys. Gudis gets no offensive production, so that brought down everybody's average a little bit. And the goaltending, Carter Hart dra- uh, dragged everybody else down a little bit with him. Um, and I mentioned his file already. Um, but just looking at the four draft rules that I've established on this channel and for myself personally in my draft, did I do what I've said that you should do all along? So I waited on goalies. I didn't get anybody in the top two rounds. And in fact, I pushed them back to the sixth round where I then went back to back with them. And that proved to be a decent strategy in this particular draft. So check that one off. Two elite power play quarterback D in the first five rounds. Check. We got Ekblad and Morgan Riley. Prioritized goal scoring wingers, right wingers specifically. Check. I got Pasternak with that third pick for that. I got Cole Caulfield a little bit later for that. Uh, and then I have Philip Forsberg, a goal scoring left winger, and Dry Seidel, who I would probably use as a left winger at some points during the season. So check that off. And then hits and blocks coverage with the D4 specifically. Check that off. I did get my hits guy in Radko Gudis. I got Trocheck. And then a couple of other guys do chip in some hits, guys like Shabbat. Um, Morgan Riley a little bit, Philip Forsberg gets some hits. So yes, I did all the things that I set out to do in this draft. Um, is this team going to win a championship? Well, that's to be determined. You have to make some moves during the season. And, uh, you know, the waiver wire is a place that you do need to, uh, keep an eye on throughout the season. Um, but all in all, I think, uh, this is the type of strategy that can produce results for you. I have two excellent goaltenders that should cover that category. Uh, and I've gone through pretty much every other file on this list at one point or another. Um, so I do have everything that I need there. So there you have it. Um, there's the different thought processes and the strategy for this particular mock draft, which was a little bit more interesting with more people in it. Um, and, then, you know, there were several times I was targeting a guy and he got taken out from under me, which doesn't happen earlier in the season. So as we get closer to draft time, expect some movements with these ADPs and some of the deeper plays like Marshan, Point, McAvoy. You may want to target them a little bit earlier than they're scheduled to go um, just so you make sure you can get them if you want to target them specifically, if you have more than one IR spot. Um, that's another thing too. If you only have one IR spot, you can't get two of those guys. You have to kind of pick which one you want to stash on your IR if that's the route you want to go. Um, but that'll do it for this video. I want to thank my Patreon subscribers and the Discord server for their input on a lot of topics, changing my mind on a few things. Uh, and if you want access to the charts and graphs that I use on my channel, you can find them in the Patreon link in the description below for just $3. And for $5, you get access to those charts and graphs and the Discord server as well. And in that server, you can ask me questions about your team specifically. I'll help you use the data to make better, more informed decisions for your team specifically. And I also wanted to mention really quickly that I recently did a live session with one of my patrons where we did a mock draft, went over his strategy, I answered his questions, and we tailored a draft strategy to his specific league format. So if you'd be interested in having me on live video chat with you during your draft, I'm offering that service now for a flat fee of $30, which is a bit steeper than I'd personally like to charge. But what you get for that is you get me for an hour and a half to two hours, and you're essentially getting a data analyst for your draft. And if you're playing for money, that investment during your draft could mean the difference between winning and losing or your, you know, all of your buy-in money. Um, so just something to consider. I know it's not going to be for everybody, but I have had a few requests for this, and I'd like to accommodate those requests and help you guys however I can. Um, but that's going to do it for this video. I want to thank you guys for sticking through all the way to the end, and I will see you in the next one.